Uh, good evening, everyone. Sir, is this uh, screen visible and am I audible? Yes, yes. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, yeah. Uh, so thank you for to the organizers for giving me this opportunity. Uh, my topic for today is the uh, role of first generation EGFR TKIs as adjuvant therapy in patients who have undergone uh, surgery, non-small cell cancer with uh, EGFR sensitizing uh, mutations. So as we know, the current guidelines for adjuvant chemotherapy or systemic therapy in stage one to three and non-small cell can cancer, the recommendation of by various guidelines is mainly for stage two AB and stage three A disease and a few patients who have high risk 1B disease. Uh, th as this uh, slide shows, the benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy increases as uh, you go across from stage one to stage three with patients with stage two and stage three disease having a higher uh, benefit by giving adjuvant therapy as compared to the smaller benefit seen in stage one disease. So uh, adjuvant chemotherapy is standard of care for patients with stage 2A, B or stage 3A disease. And the meta-analysis that we all know, the LACE meta-analysis showed an absolute survival benefit of 5%. And that is what is routinely used in patients post uh, resection today. But uh, what is the role of first generation TKIs in patients with EGFR mutations and uh, in, adju in the adjuvant setting? And uh, these are the studies. So there have been multiple uh, retrospective and multiple prospective studies as well, uh, which have seen the role of uh, EGFR TKIs. And uh, with the EGFR TKIs, which I would be discussing, are the first and genera second genera first generation TKIs as uh, compared to uh, uh, the third generation ozimertinib. So these are various studies which looked at the role of these TKIs either in comparison, uh, in combination with chemotherapy or uh, versus chemotherapy in patients who with rejected uh, uh, lung cancer. Uh, so you can see some of them are phase three and some of them are uh, phase two trials. What is important to note is that uh, there are only four positive studies among these. Uh, one including the adjuvant CETONG, which had an updated uh, update presented at ASCO last year, and SELECT, which was a phase two trial, and EVAN, and this PCG, which is a combination of uh, jeftinib with chemotherapy in the adjuvant setting. Also to note that the selection or the, the uh, the inclusion criteria for these trials varied. Uh, in, uh, in this trial, which was the NCIC BR19 trial, uh, 1B to 3A were unselected. That is, the EGFR mutation status was not used as a selection criteria. In the radiant trial, the EGFR, muta uh, EGFR status was used, but it was uh, tested by the IHC of FISH, not the standard RT PCR that is used to detect a sensitizing mutation. And Whereas the CETONG trial looked at patients with a sensitizing EGFR mutation that is deletion 19 or L858R. And if you also look at the, uh, the number of uh, the years or the number of months that patients received therapy varied, but uh, a common uh, uh, duration of two years was seen in multiple trials. And as you can see the results, many of these trials were negative except for the CETONG trial, which had a hazard ratio of 0.6 for, and a DFS benefit of around 10 months, which was significant. And an updated uh, DFS, which was uh, presented at ASCO last year, was also uh, the benefit was maintained for DFS, but there was no OS benefit. So this is another uh, uh, a phase two trial, which was positive. This was a not ran non-randomized trial, which showed the uh, effect of erlotinib as adjuvant therapy. In uh, this is the plot showing in various stages, uh, the outcomes in various stages. As you can see here, the stage one patients did better. So this is the adjuvant uh, CETONG trial, which was the, uh, the one of the positive trials uh, for first generation TKI in the adjuvant setting. Here patients with uh, pathologically uh, rejected pathological stage two or three A disease who had pathological N1 or N2 nodes were uh, selected and they had to have an EGFR activating mutation. And uh, they were randomized to either jeftinib or to chemotherapy that was venerolbin cisplatin. The patients in the jeftinib arm did not receive chemotherapy, unlike the ADORA tr trial in which uh, patients were included after they completed the act. Most of the patients had received some form of adjuvant chemotherapy. So this is the initial results where the benefit was seen of adding jeftinib over venerolbin cisplatin. And this is the update uh, uh, last year, the jeftinib arm uh, did better than the uh, venerolbin cisplatin arm. However, if you look at the overall survival, there was no benefit either in the intention to treat or the, uh, the uh, per protocol population. 
And in various subgroups, the use of Jeftinib did not seem to improve the overall survival significantly as compared to uh, Vinarelbin cisplatin. So, uh, uh, unfortunately, in this study, the benefit with disease-free survival did not translate into a uh, benefit in overall survival. And the uh, only thing what the authors did as a postdoc analysis is they saw the duration of therapy and they saw that the patients who had longer duration, that is more than one and a half years, they fared better than those who had uh, adjuvant Jeftinib for less than one and a half years. A similar trial, but this is a negative trial, was with the use of adjuvant erlotinib versus placebo in patients with stage 1 to uh, 1b to 3a non-small cell lung cancer. Uh, the kaplan mayer here is in the entire population. Now, the thing about this trial is it selected patients based on the EGFR, IHC, or FISH, not the sensitizing mutations, but they had a secondary endpoint which looked at uh, the DFS in patients with the sensitizing mutations as well. And there seems to be a benefit here, but it was not significant because of the hierarchical testing. Uh, and so this was a negative trial. There was no benefit in the primary endpoint, which was a disease-free survival. So uh, what, what is the overall consensus on the use of first-line uh, a first generation TKIs in the adjuvant setting. So this is a recently published meta-analysis which showed that uh, overall there seemed to be a benefit of the with the use of adjuvant TKI. But uh, as you can see, the trials which are included here, this is the uh, Adora trial with Ozimatinib. So they use different agents. They also had some trials had the use, like Adora had the... Okay, uh, of adjuvant chemotherapy, which was then, uh, so the chemotherapy regimens differed and the population included differ. So there are some issues with the first generation TKIs in the adjuvant setting. And one which I already discussed is that the consensus is, it's difficult to reach a consensus in the role of the first generation TKI because a lot of the trials were heterogeneous. Multiple trials have different criteria and it is difficult based on the available data to decide which population will benefit from the first generation TKI. Uh, the second thing is the optimal duration of the adjuvant TKI is not clear. Uh, most studies, it's two years, but there have been variations. Uh, what only thing it is too important to note is that patients who took longer TKI had bet, uh, did better, like the post-hoc analysis in the adjuvant uh, trial. Uh, so how do you place the TKI in the adjuvant treatment strategy, whether it's TKI alone, uh, like the adjuvant trial, TKI after chemotherapy, like the ADORA trial, or the TKI with chemotherapy is also not clear based on the available data. And the thing is, if patient progresses after the use of adjuvant TKI, what happens to the patient next? So this uh, slide shows that in patients who received Jeftinib as adjuvant therapy, around 36.8% went on to receive TKI when they progressed. And uh, in patients who received chemotherapy, around 51% received TKI. And there were responses. So patients who received subsequent TKI after adjuvant TKI did respond to uh, the subsequent TKI therapy. As you can see in these graphs, there were significant CR, PR, and stable disease. Uh, there's another debate about the use of DFS as an endpoint in most of the trials, especially considering this is an adjuvant setting. So the debate is whether just a disease-free uh, period, which is longer, is acceptable versus a complete cure of disease. And the question of quality of life, because these TKIs, though uh, don't cause severe, may not cause very life-threatening effects, but they do have a significant impact in terms of toxicity like skin rash and diarrhea on the quality of life. And the third and the most important question is, what is the role of the first generation TKI in, uh, today when we have the results of the ADORA uh, study, which showed such a, a big difference in the uh, disease-free survival in patients who received ozimatinib versus, versus placebo? And that is a question that is uh, the, uh, the main question now. Moving ahead, uh, again, as I said, third generation TKI Adora might be uh, the way to go based on the available data. Also, the value of chemotherapy, because we've seen in both the first generation and third generation TKIs, uh, there has been a benefit in various studies with TKI. So is the uh, adjuvant chemotherapy really necessary? And in which patients is it essential? Can we spare certain groups of patients from the toxic effects of chemotherapy? Also, the role of cell-free DNA and monitoring residual disease like we do in hematological tumors and whether it might help us tailor adjuvant therapy. And the role or the guidelines for molecular testing in early stage cancer is not yet clear. So with this, I would end my presentation. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank uh, you. Thank you, Dr. Nandini Menon. Uh, sorry, because of constraints of time, we'll move on to our next uh, uh, presentation. So I would like to call Dr. Mansi Sharma. Dr. Mansi Sharma is a consultant medical oncologist at Rajiv Gandhi Cancer Institute and Research Center, Delhi. And Mansi Sharma will talk on multi-center analysis of neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy 
in stage 2b 4b uh, non small cell lung cancer resulting in curative surgery and routine clinical care that is compass new uh, new op study yeah so dr mansi please hi good evening good evening dr amol so i'll just i hope i'm audible yeah yeah you are audible okay fantastic i'll share my screen so um my first slide you've actually already uh, spoken for me good evening everybody i'll be discussing the compass new op trial this was presented as a poster in elcc so um as we know that uh, addition of cisplatin based uh, therapy either in the new adjuvant or adjuvant setting has led to survival benefit in resectable nsclc post surgery and however there is still an unmet need to improve these outcomes because uh, uh, some of these patients do recur and die of disease within 5 years notably uh, patients those who have a higher stage uh, looking at uh, the previous uh, uh, excellent results of chemoimmunotherapy in advanced disease now the focus is shifting upon to try to improve outcomes by giving chemoimmunotherapy or immunotherapy in the earlier line setting as new adjuvant therapy and the basis for this is that preclinical studies have seen that you know uh, there is a potential advantage uh, where, where probably the tumor cells are killed the new new antigens are released and uh, this stimulates the priming and expansion uh, expansion of new antigen specific t cells in the tumor as well as in the peripheral blood which can have effect on the micrometastasis and uh, there have been recently uh, phase 1 phase 2 and of course now a phase 3 trial which has reported the feasibility of uh, this particular combination prior to surgery so what these authors did was they did a retrospective multi center real world analysis of patients with locally resectable nsclc they included patients from uh, stage 2b onwards till 4b as well which is basically oligo oligometastatic disease up to four sites they gave them uh, either neoadjuvant immunotherapy or a combination of immunochemo for 3 to 4 cycles then did a resection of the disease followed by some patients uh, received consolidating immunotherapy as well as per recommendation of the local tumor boards the primary endpoint was a uh, rate of pathological complete response as well as major pathological response pathological complete response essentially is no tumor at all in either the tissue or the nodes major pathological responses around uh, less than 10% secondary endpoints were also resist defined uh, 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 response rates feasibility of r0 resection recurrence free survival and overall survival so totally uh, in total they had 57 patients out of seven centers and as you can see almost 42% of these patients had uh, stage 4a uh, 4b disease and uh, even out of the 58% patients uh, some patients had 3c disease as well so it was a fairly advanced stage population uh, nearly two thirds of the pa uh, patient population had adenocarcinoma and uh, almost 90% of the patients had a pdl1 positive score uh, approximately 46% had a pdl score of uh, more than uh, 50% coming to the treatment that they received uh, nearly 90% of the patients received uh, a combination immunochemotherapy and around 11% received monotherapy immunotherapy and in the adjuvant setting around 21% of the patients went on to receive consolidation immunotherapy and another 4% received immunotherapy in combination with some form of radiation or the other Uh, almost seventy percent of the patients were just observed. So, looking at results, if you look at radiological response, there were almost four percent uh, complete responses, seventy-eight uh, percent partial responses, and there was no progressive disease seen in this particular cohort. Uh, with regard to surgical outcomes, almost ninety-five percent of the patients underwent an R zero resection. and uh, coming to the main uh, 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 primary endpoint nearly 53% of the patients had a pathological complete response and 12% of the patients had a major pathological response as well uh, they also noted that those patients who had non metastatic disease had higher rates of pathological responses as compared to those patients who had oligometastatic disease uh, notably almost 10 patients underwent uh, brain metastasis uh, resection and seven patient underwent resection of metastasis at other sites so all in all they treated these patients fairly aggressively uh, now this is the swimmer plot uh, looking at uh, individual uh, patient data uh, since this was uh, just a poster they don't have any uh, 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 specific data with regard to survival only thing is that after a median follow up of 17 months around 12% of patients had recurrence and around 3% uh, uh, three patients had died 
So the authors concluded that this is the largest multicentric cohort of neoadjuvant chemoimmunotherapy. And they noticed a PCR or MPR in more than two thirds of patients, which is comparable to that seen in clinical trials. They did see a higher pathological response rate in patients with non-metastatic disease, which implies that patients may, you know, with a higher tumor burden of disease may need more uh, neoadjuvant treatment. Uh, they said this is the, the, the survival data, uh, although early is encouraging. And uh, it is more, more importantly, in the routine clinical practice, this uh, combination, uh, especially uh, uh, neoadjuvant following resection for surgery is uh, both feasible as well as safe. So to put things into perspective, uh, these are the uh, other trials uh, that uh, have looked at both neoadjuvant uh, chemoimmunotherapy combinations. Uh, mostly, if you can see that uh, they, they were either a single arm phase two trials and uh, the uh, Checkmate 816, which was re reported recently, was a phase three trial. Uh, the, our, this particular study does differ uh, in certain aspects, namely uh, that this is a real world data, observational data. Uh, the type of immunotherapy that they gave has not been specified. And more importantly, they, uh, it's not exactly a neoadjuvant trial because they included uh, patients with oligometastatic disease as well. Um, the other thing is we're not sure whether they included uh, biomarker selected populations or not. And uh, they did give uh, neoadjuvant uh, adjuvant immunotherapy in around 20% of cases. However, in spite of that, uh, the PATCR rates and the major pathological response rates seem to be almost, uh, you know, comparable to the uh, that seen in the other trials. If not, maybe a little, maybe a little more. Uh, same goes for uh, radiological response rates. So to summarize, I would say that yes, this real-world analysis of patients with oligometastatic as well as non-metastatic NSCLC does suggest feasibility of this combination as a neoadjuvant therapy and does lead to an achievement of a high PATCR and a major pathological response. However, this was a very heterogeneous patient population. So we're technically not really talking about just early stage NSCLC, uh, neoadjuvant therapy. And uh, the, of course, it's a selected uh, patient population. So maybe there is a selection bias, which is showing these improved outcomes. Uh, we also need long-term survival data about these patients uh, to further see what the role is. Uh, also, uh, we know that it has been seen that uh, achievement of PATCR and MPR has been associated with, uh, there is a better uh, association uh, in patients who have received uh, neoadjuvant chemotherapy and CRT with better survival. We still don't know whether this translates into a better survival in patients who receive immunotherapy or combination immunochemo. And this, of course, needs further validation in larger populations with a larger or longer follow-up. Uh, also, uh, this, uh, this, uh, the thought that uh, we need probably more uh, neoadjuvant treatment in those patients who have oligometastatic disease is definitely thought-provoking. Uh, and uh, uh, to end, I would say that yes, the present role of immunochemo combination in early stage NSL NSCLC is still undefined. And there are uh, ongoing phase three studies which are looking at uh, this and hopefully we'll get more and more uh, data soon. Notably, all of these trials, uh, Checkmate 816, Keynote 671, IM Power 30, and Egan, they all have EFS as a primary endpoint along with the rates of pathological response. So uh, that would be an important point to see later on. So especially with regard to long-term survival data. So then, uh, you know, that will help us better de delineate this role of the combination in uh, this patient population. So uh, to end, I would like to say that, yes, science gives hope, especially in today's uh, dark world. And a big thank you to all our healthcare workers. Uh, this has been tough uh, this last, uh, these last couple of months and hope things settle soon. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mansi Sharma for this excellent presentation. So we'll move on.